He's got a PhD and a podcast. The great, learned Father Josiah Trenum joins us now. I'm James Polis. Welcome to Zero Hour. Father Josiah Trenum is pastor of St. Andrew Orthodox Church in Riverside, California. He's also the founder and director of Patristic Nectar Publications. Welcome, Father. Thank you, James. It's good to be with you. It's wonderful to be with you, too. Well, these are, by any measure, crazy times, I think most people would say, uh, whether it's the eclipse or the presidential election or the many wars that are breaking out oh. around the world. Um, it seems hard to imagine how a people in spiritual chaos could not expect political chaos to, uh, to, to break out across the land. But from where you're sitting, uh, Riverside, California, it's, it's in a way it's anywhere USA. It, it's definitely Californian, but, but not as, as much as the coast. From where you're sitting, uh, what is the spiritual health of America these days? Well, James, if you had asked me that four years ago, I would have answered you with tears running down my face. The radical decline of self-identified Christians uh, in America, the incredible increase of people who profess no knowledge of God, no religious conviction whatsoever. That has been the trajectory of our nation for decades until the hideous COVID appeared. And for the last four years in my pastoral experience and also in my observation, my larger observation of the country, we are in the midst of an extremely blessed and fruitful time. I, I feel like pinching myself saying that since COVID was so hideous and brought out the exposed, the rotten underpinnings of uh, governance in America today, the thirsty authoritarian and, uh, authoritarians and dictators all over the place, especially in California, where our governor lived with a perpetual state of emergency and didn't want to give it up, wouldn't even allow uh, any of his financial decisions to be uh, discussed with a supermajority Democrat legislature in California, 75% Democrats. Not even they could talk to him about how much money he was going to be spending. He wanted to shut down the churches. He wanted to regulate whether we could sing or not when we literally, he lost five Supreme Court cases before finally acknowledging that he had lost one and uh, allowing some freedom uh, to the churches. So as hideous as it was, and as uh, revelatory of how far we have fallen from classic Americanism, let alone Christianity, I have seen in these years something that I never thought uh, I would see, which is a, a radical openness to belief in God, a great interest that shows no signs of slowing down whatever uh, in repentance and the embrace of the Christian faith, especially by young people. And I would attribute it to the appearance of death. It's not what uh, the secularists who have been man managing the whole COVID crisis have wanted, for sure, but it has been the fruit. Death appeared, and the post-Christian secular West has no answer for death. It can prosper as long as you keep death hidden, as long as you keep your parents dying in hospitals or in old folks' homes and not in your home, as long as death can be properly managed, then you don't have to uh, be exposed for having literally no solution for the greatest human problem. But COVID brought death right before our faces in a very aggressive way. It shook the very rotten foundations of unbelief. And I have seen a massive increase of uh, interest, religious interest. So I'm feeling particularly hopeful. Your parish is growing, has been growing for, for several years. Uh, can you share anything about what people say to you when they come to you and express interest, express their inquiry in the, in the church and, and where they, uh, they characterize themselves? Certainly uh, I can. That is a significant percentage of my life is dealing with people who are wanting to become Christians 
wanting to put their feet solidly uh, in the cement of uh, Christian confession. I've had an, a fairly enthusiastic evangelistic plan in our parish since its founding, which was 32 years ago, 1992, we started our parish. And the church has been consistently growing. But the numbers of those who have, are coming to the church and who are seeking to enroll, for instance, in catechism have tripled in the last four years and have remained at those numbers. There's no sign of decrease uh, of interest. Most of those who are coming are coming from nothing. They're coming from no previously uh, practiced religious confession. And they're finding that that level of emptiness, that le level of lack of, uh, m of commitment uh, in, of their heart to most, the most fundamental things is unsatisfying to them. They're, they've tried this uh, secular life and they have found it wanting. That's the common theme for almost everyone who's coming to the church. Is this a situation where they're, even in their, their family and their upbringing, there was no kind of, of religious experience? For the younger ones, for the ones who are in their early 20s, there's been almost nothing, almost nothing. You know, the, the religious scene in America since the late 60s, the Roman Catholic Church, which from 1890 until 1960 was on an ascendancy that uh, if it had maintained itself, we would be a, a Roman Catholic nation. Uh, you know, when John F. Kennedy was running for president, he was very concerned, the whole nation was concerned about this ascendant Catholicism. There were six million students in Roman Catholic schools in 1955. That is an incredible number. Since that time, uh, due to an over-Americanization and a loss of salt uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, the, the church has, has declined radically. For decades, for every one new person becoming Catholic, six would leave the church. That's a terrible equation. Today, the Roman Catholic school system has 1.5 million kids in it. That's a 75% uh, reduction uh, in, in America. So we've seen this, the, this real decline. So a lot, a lot of people who, uh, for instance, where, I'm, where I live, the majority of people in the Inland Empire are of Hispanic background. You might think that being Hispanics, they, they have some association with the Roman Catholic Church. That was true if they're maybe 30 or older. But for most of these kids who are coming uh, to the Christian faith, who are young adults now, they really had nothing. They really had nothing. Maybe they've uh, dabbled here and there with um, some megachurch experiences, and they have been provoked to uh, an awareness of the significance of Holy Scripture, the fact that the Bible is, is an extremely important canonical text. I would also say that they've been deeply impacted by the Internet, uh, and not just by the, the sorrow of the internet, things like internet pornography, which, are, which is decimating people's lives today, but also by many of the beautiful things. The internet has become the Roman roads of uh, evangelization for priests and pastors uh, who are using the internet to, to reach people uh, in ways that they never could before. So today, three out of four of the young people and even the older folks who are coming to my parish asking for religious instruction site that they first discovered us on the internet. That's incredible. They found us on YouTube. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about all things internet in a little bit, but you used a very important, uh, fascinating word, a uh, term that, that's not thrown around a lot uh, these days, which is over-Americanization. Mm. Uh, a lot of Americans right now think that, well, if America's not working so well, we just need more America. We need to intensify our Americanness. What did you mean by that? I'm using the word, James, in reference to uh, an experience, a religious experience that was taking place in the Roman Catholic Church, which was in an effort to become accepted. You know, when the, when the Catholics came here uh, by immigration, they were very much looked down upon. And that's not just a Catholic experience, that's also a, an Eastern Orthodox experience. Uh, the Orthodox Christians who came here uh, from Europe and the Middle East, uh, especially through Ellis Island, they found themselves um, in a Protestant milieu in which they were very much questioned. And so we, we tried to accommodate uh, American sensibilities without losing the substance of our faith. 
the Latins, the Catholics tried to do the same thing in, in, at that time of very Protestant America. The fine line between how far you bend to become acceptable to a nation that is not yours or is newly acquired in your life, how far you go with, while at the same time being faithful to your roots, that's a huge question. And the American religious scene is extremely potent. Unlike Western Europe that has abandoned faith wholesale, even in our secular reality in America, we still want to think we're Christians. Still, there's a majority of Americans who want to have a, a, a sense that God is happy with us and he's happy with our country. And so there's, a, there's the pressure for Christians to make sure that they're acceptable in the religious scene. And what that meant for Catholics very much was to downplay those aspects of the Roman Catholic faith, which were not acceptable to Americans. For instance, today to this day, a vast majority of Roman Catholics do not believe many teachings of their faith, many moral teachings of their faith, which they think are incompatible with American life. The most obvious example, the elephant in the room for most Catholics, is their belief in contraception. This is a, a formal, infallible, in the Roman Catholic concept, infallible teaching, ethical teaching, and like 75% of Roman Catholics don't believe it at all. So that, that, uh, that willingness to place uh, the current cultural mores above their most fundamental religious convictions, this is something that tempts them more than just in the issue of contraception. President Kennedy was literally asked uh, if his Roman Catholic faith would influence his legislation and what he would support, and he had to say no. Now, anybody listening to that knows that that's completely nonsense. If a person's most preciously held religious convictions are not going to inform his legislation, what is? And whatever that thing is, is his religion. Mm -hmm. But he had to say it because of the nervousness that was around having a, the first Catholic president of the United States. So that's a, a form, 50 years old, 60 years old now, of over-Americanization. But I would say that concept... Uh, as an umbrella concept, is a temptation for any Christian to want to place um, acceptable American convictions over preciously held religious convictions. And when your religious convictions, when your convictions as a Christian are in conflict with what is popular in America, I'm sorry, it's the latter that has to give. If we compromise our religious convictions in order to appease what is popular in America, I mean, haven't we seen that what's unpopular in America is changing like every three days? Very quickly. Yesterday it's this, today it's that. I mean, what we have so cut ourselves from any fundamental philosophical or religious convictions as a people that I, I think my children growing up in the America today have very little understanding of what I think about America and what it was like when I was growing up. Two different concepts. And yet, you're, you're quite right to identify this strange phenomenon, at least on the surface, where you look at Western Europe and it's almost a desert uh, when it comes yes. to, to formal religious observance. And then you come over to America where things are constantly changing, people seem to be more welcoming of all those various kinds of craziness, uh, heterodox doctrines, new age, you got churches with rainbow flags flying, it's a free-for-all. And in spite of this fact, and in spite of the fact that if you look at the media and you look at what politicians often say, they portray this as a land where Christianity is already irrelevant or is just drying up and is going to blow away. That's not what the people really seem to feel. They seem to feel that some kind of spirituality is absolutely essential to everyday life, even if they are proud to profess doctrines that were maybe, you know, uh, uh, two or three days old, depending on, on what the doctrine in question is. What do you attribute that to, that in spite of the fact that this is such a, a, a really chaotic spiritual environment, there is such a deep spiritual longing among the people? Uh, there is. Certainly, I, I agree with you 100%. And anyone who wants to rule out the influence of religion in American life uh, is going to probably lose. There may be many factors that contribute to this. One of them is that we, uh, our system of religion is very much uh, influenced by our political system, which means that we have, we have a free market religious system. 
We don't have a religion that's associated formally with the state. We don't have a state church. All the Western European countries that have formal state churches have seen radical decline, complete apostasy, in fact, complete apostasy. In America, religion has very much been a matter of the people and has had to be sold, literally sold, as a, as a commercial item uh, to people. That has its downsides, but it also has its upsides. It keeps uh, pastors engaged. We can't rest on our laurels that somehow, because we're part of the official establishment, we're going to be here tomorrow. It, practically speaking, it means in our churches that uh, rather than being supported by the state and having churches funded by the state, We've rolled up our sleeves, religiously speaking. Our people have had to build their churches. Our people have had to maintain their churches. And so it's been something that has become part and parcel of being an American, is that you have your church and you participate in its maintenance. Whether that vision uh, that has kept us vibrant religiously will continue uh, at, at this time, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm hopeful is that the church is being so targeted right now. The church is being targeted politically. The church is being targeted socially. I mean, if the numbers of churches that have been torched, literally burned and vandalized this year, several hundred percent increase year over year. I mean, there is a full scale uh, attack on Christian churches and that's the best possible thing that could ever happen to us. <laughs> this is when we really thrive uh, is when our faith coughs us something, and we have the opportunity to uh, be stigmatized. When the church is persecuted, she becomes herself, and she can most identify with her master, the Lord Christ, who didn't have anybody supporting him. He was abandoned by everyone, even his closest followers. And by the power of his death and his resurrection, conquering death, exploded the truth to the earth, to the ends of the earth, with no money, no state sponsorship, nothing. So this is a very hopeful time for us, especially if it moves to the point of martyrdom. For us, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Opportunities for Christians to show their mettle, to show their quality, by remaining who they are, remaining faithful to God, even when everything's taken away from them, being very heavily attacked and criticized while remaining committed to loving their opponents, to loving their enemies even. This is the ultimate apologetic. This is what proves that we're not talking about religious fantasy. Jesus Christ is alive, James. He sits right now as the King of Kings, at the right hand of his father, until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. He's governing all things for the good of everyone who seeks him, to try to wash and save the whole world. This is his ambition. He wants everyone. He wants everyone forgiven. He wants everyone washed clean. He wants everyone infused with hope. He wants everyone attached to his kingdom and a recipient of eternal life. This is God's will for the world. This is why Christ came in the first place. And this is a moment for us. This is an incredible moment for us to show our true colors, our true quality in America. And we may see a beautiful, we may see what I was describing earlier happening on the local level in Southern California. I can't project it all across the country, but I do know many places it's happening there. We may see something much larger in the positive direction. They say that good men create good times. Well, the same is true of businesses. Good people are the bedrock of a successful enterprise. Unfortunately, the hiring pool today is bleak. Political demands, petty entitlement, and open incompetence are now commonplace. You need to reach the people who are keen to join your business. New Founding has created a network of high excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded American businesses. These are individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready for a team and mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are using this network to hire high-trust, exceptional individuals who match the culture and the mission of their teams. Apply for access to the New Founding Talent Network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with the candidates who will build up your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. 
Well, there's a, a strange irony. I, I think in some ways martyrdom is almost an easier sell in America than, than persecution is, you know, especially with, with younger men. And I, I've noticed it, others have noticed it. There is a definite uptick in younger guys c coming to the church and saying, you know, I, help me out. But a lot of them, uh, they still want distinction. They want to matter. They want yes. some kind of renown. They want yes. to be able to demonstrate that of they course. have leadership capability and that they can present themselves uh, without shame before the world. Uh, yes. This is a time of, you know, we've got international conflicts. We've got, uh, y there's always talk of a sort of cold civil war playing out in America. And I think for those rising generations of young men, especially the ones who, uh, who are turning to... Uh, to, to Christianity, um, this is a, a, a sort of a, a point of unease for them, where they're more interested in talking about how, you know, maybe we ought to have a monarchy or, you know, we ought to rule <laughs> sure. in a certain sure. way. Sure. And uh, that, that desire to kind of participate in something where, you know, we can go back to the ideals that are the, the true, pure way of living uh, with, with strength and, and with power. For, for folks like that, it's, you know, it's a really harsh uh, counsel to say, well, maybe you just need to quietly suffer more and wait patiently. Uh, how do you respond to those kind of that that spirit of the younger generation that looks around and says, you know, look, our 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 forefathers failed us. Our country is in ruins. It's sort of a jump ball for control. Uh, we need to look back centuries and make America more like that. Ooh. you are stirring my heart. I feel my blood pumping <laughs> <laughs> as you're describing this thirst for significance amongst young men particularly. I mean, look what has happened to our young men. How trivialized they have been. How absolutely trounced. We have been attacking young men for decades. Yeah. Our school system, the feminization of our culture. Forgive me, even the churches, especially the Protestant churches, have been so feminized. It, imagine that the... the, the the typical kind of mega church worship experience. You have, you have rock stars, Christian rock stars on the stage. They're playing beautiful music. The people are having their hands up and they're kind of moving back in erotic motions. It's almost orgasmic. It's very feminine. A man who is made to lead, to die, to fight, what's he going to do there? He's, 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 there's, a, there's a reason that 70%, at least, those are the low numbers, 70% of congregants in these, in these Protestant churches are women. There's a reason that the men have left both the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And they come to Holy Orthodoxy, and they walk in, let's say in Lent right now, we're in, still in the middle of Lent. They come in, and they see families making full prostrations to the ground in pre-sanctified liturgy. Mm -hmm. They hear from the priests that they're expected to fast, even if it's uncomfortable. And they think, I can't believe, I can't believe the church is actually asking for some sacrifice on my part. It stirs up their very humanity. They want to do this. You know, Jesus did not say, don't be great. He didn't say, he said just the opposite. He said, if you want to be great, become the slave of everyone. So many people look at him and they think, oh, he's just opposing human greatness. No, he's opposing selfish human greatness. He's opposing a concept of greatness that is about power, the acquisition of power. He eviscerates that concept. Dictatorship, tyrants are disgusting people. They're spit upon by successive generations, and they're thrown in the trash heap of Appropriate. I mean, that's nonsense. If you want to be great, be like Christ, the, the most famous man who has ever lived on the planet Earth. Be like his mother, the most cited, significant woman to this day in the history of the human race. And what did they do? They lived before, Christ lived before his father. He put the, he put the governance of his interior life number one. So much so that he didn't think a thought his father didn't want him to think. According to his own testimony, he never spoke a word except the words that his father gave him to say. This is an extreme obedience. It's something that you might compare to a military discipline, except even higher. He faced the greatest opponents in life. Satan. Death. 
The most powerful pol politicians in the Middle East, they all stood against him, and they couldn't break him. And God vindicated him and raised him from where they put him. And he's calling for sons and daughters to be co-bearers of his cross with him. This is a path of tremendous significance. He gives us a path of self-denial where we can learn to lay our lives down for someone else. You know, selfishness, the pursuit of money and lands, all of which are going to be pulled out of your fingers when you die. Very shallow, very unsatisfying. But to develop a relationship with God that doesn't end, to develop, to develop true friendship that will endure past death, to be part of a community that is not just rooted in history. It's wonderful to be an American. I'm happy. I wouldn't want to be in any other country. But my real happiness is to be a Christian and a part of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is eternal. The things that I'm invested in and that Christians are primarily invested in laying our lives down to serve God, to love people, to build the presence of his kingdom here and now, to be salt and light, these things last forever. They're tremendously significant. And I think young men are saying, yes, I want that. That doesn't mean it's easy to do. If it was easy, it wouldn't be significant. Nothing significant is easy. It hurts, it costs, it's hard, but that's because it's so important. I've been thinking a lot about the, uh, the 40 holy martyrs Ooh. You got the, the, the Lightning Legion, uh, Roman legionaries, uh, tough men, seasoned veterans. Um, they were not on the internet criticizing the Roman Empire. They were not raising a stink about the regime um, until the point at which they were um, commanded to worship pagan idols. And that is where the resistance began. Uh, and led, led rather quickly, but by, by way of flattery and torture and some other attempts to get them to change their mind. Um, but in short order, they, they were martyred. Um, where do you draw that line? How do you help people understand where to fruitfully draw that line between just kind of going along with whatever your government says and... Uh, making a stink about what your government is doing if indeed it begins to turn against uh, what it is that's at the core of your faith? Well, that's a very wonderful question. There is a lot of stink, and we're led into stink, we're provoked into stink by our technology. I remember once... Uh, going to hear Dr. Jordan Peterson, who came to my town in mm -hmm. 2019 when he went on his first tour. I took Presitera, my wife, uh, to see him, and we stayed afterwards so that we could converse with him a little bit. And uh, we asked him about the acrimony that permeates our, our digital connections, especially uh, in texting and uh, using X and Twitter and these types. Why is everything so acrimonious? Why are comments so poisonous? And how do we stop that? I was fascinated by his answer. I was expecting a profound answer, but not this profound. His answer was, we can't. <laughs> he said, it's built into the system. Mm -hmm. When you're expected to comment on everything you see, let's say someone, someone comes to listen to James Poulos, and they watch one of your videos in which you're sharing your knowledge of political economy that you have spent decades investing in your own mind to understand. Someone watches the video and they think it's appropriate to comment on that? Where did they get that idea? It's built in, they're taught that, but it's poisonous. Students should listen and then keep listening and then keep listening. That's the position of a student, the idea that everything has to be judged. And even the great scholars of our time, people who have invested decades of their life in certain areas, have to be evaluated by everybody who watches them. You know, on my platform, on Patristic Nectar, for years, I let no comments be on it all. This was to the aggravation of my media team. Of course. <laughs> you have to drive engagement. You have to that. drive engagement, right. I'm like, well, I'm not interested in engagement. At that level, I'm, I'm not trying to become a digital pastor to people. I have 
a real church mm -hmm. with real people that I see, I hear their confessions, I visit their homes, I meet them in the hospital when they're sick. That's enough for me. What I'm trying to do is use the platform to help people engage ideas, ideas that I think are from God and that will greatly help their life. But forgive me, and I don't mean any disrespect to them at all, I'm not looking for anything from them. I'm not asking them to comment on that. My team has won. <laughs> my team has won, so most of my videos mm -hmm. now have open comments, but I don't read them. I don't read them. Well, more, more and more people are choosing not to read the comments, but it, it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll break the fourth wall a little bit here. It, it is difficult when you are in the media business to find a way to make an impact and, and locate an audience and engage with that audience without falling into the trap of continuing this cycle of criticism, yes. of constant and incessant criticism. I mean, this just this past week, um, but it's really been longer than that. But really, things seem to be coming to a head. I don't know if it's the run-up to the election or what it is, where so many people who I know personally, who I see periodically in real life, uh, I just I watch them on the internet just tearing one another apart day in and day out. And it's almost as if uh, it's almost as if they can't help themselves. And yes. the fact that they can't help themselves makes the rancor all the more vicious. It's a demonic trick. If we can always remain in a flutter about our politicians, and we always have an opportunity to say this person's so bad and that person is so bad, we keep our powers from where they really need to be focused. And that is not, not the earth out there, not Washington, D.C., but wherever I live. And not just where I live, but my house, and not just my house, my person. And not just my person, my heart. This is the land that God has given to each of us to cultivate first. Making sure that this is properly oriented, that filth and degra degradation is removed from here, this is the project of the human person. This is what God's asking us to do, is to purify the heart because Christ says, out of the heart come all the wellspring of life. Everything flows. All words and thoughts flow out of the inner man, out of the deep, the deep person. So for young people, especially who are being engaged on social media, it's very, very important to say, to be educated, use the internet to be educated, but don't leave this. Do it from within here. Ask yourself, everything you learn, ask, how can I apply it? How can I actually make that a part of my life, something that you think is true, something that's beautiful? How can I incarnate that in my life? Not how can President Biden incarnate it in his life. I wish him well. I hope he will. But the most important person to convince is yourself. Remember when business used to be about making money, taking care of your customers, and providing for your family? What happened? Wokeness, DEI, ESG, they've conquered America's best companies, but the spirit of the American entrepreneur is still free. Now, more than ever, the best founders in America are walking away from those corrupt big corporations and blazing their own trail. New founding is rallying these founders who just want to get back to that original American idea of building inspiring and disruptive companies, the very best in the world. New founding is investing in these companies through their venture fund. The companies they invest in are defined by a simple question. Does the country we want to live in need the company this person is building? You can join them. Venture investing isn't for everyone, but if you're a serious, accredited investor who wants to see a more hopeful future for this country, go to newfounding.com backslash venture fund and apply to be an investor. Again, that's newfounding.com backslash venture fund. Join their venture fund today. Our politics does make it extra challenging to till the soil of the heart, to keep that watchful eye and keep the mind in, in the heart. Uh, but if uh, politics is war by other means, then war is perhaps one of the greatest challenges that we face in keeping ourselves focused on our own hearts first. We've got the war in Ukraine, we've got the war in, in the Middle East, in the Holy Land. Uh, these, the, 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 the suffering, the misery, um, oh. it, is, it is immense and there's no end in sight. In fact, these wars are, are probably likely to spread if uh, you spend too much time reading the news like I do. It's hard to escape that conclusion. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a challenge, a struggle that is uh, certainly 
affecting Orthodox in very large numbers um, and, and causing some divisions. Uh, the, the priest who baptized me is himself a Ukrainian refugee. These things are, are very close to home, even though they feel, uh, and in some ways they are halfway around the world. Uh, how do you take stock of the magnitude oh. of what's happening and, and the, the fears that so many feel when it comes to what might be next? My blood was pumping earlier when you brought up the subject of young men, but now my heart's in pain thinking of uh, the devastation of the wars in Ukraine and Gaza off the charts. They're of concern, of course, to the whole globe because of the potentialities of war today. We're always concerned that something's going to spin out of control, and next thing you know, we're, we have what used to be called mutually assured destruction. But for an Orthodox Christian like myself, these two areas and America's involvement in these two areas are of great concern for Orthodox Christians. You know, it's, it has seemed to me for a long time, I remember being at the National, National Press Club in DC, it must have been 10 or 15 years ago, on a panel speaking about America, American relations with Russia. And I remember saying, to start, a short statement in which I affirmed then, and I believe it even more now, that we have never, our political class has never left 1965. We are stuck. Our political leadership is stuck thinking that Russia is the Soviet Union and that uh, we are still locked in this epic battle between capitalism and communism. A lot has happened since then. The fall of communism, the rebuilding of over 30,000 churches in Russia, the rebaptism of the nation, the rebuilding of influential monasteries, the propagation of literature. We have multiple generations that have been born and been raised in Russia for whom communism was nothing. Now, as an American, am I fully satisfied with how the current Russian leadership has expunged their communist past? No. I wish Lenin was burned to dust and his ashes were scattered uh, in the ocean. I wish that Stalin wasn't in any way trying to be uh, kept as some sort of valid uh, contributor to Russian culture. I wish this name was cast into the dustbin of history in Russia. But to treat them, to treat the Russians consistently like the devil, it's irrational. This is how I look at it. It's irrational. We have an irrational anti-Russian uh, perspective amongst our governing class. I don't know what the Russians could possibly do to stop it. I really don't know. It looks so hopeful. In 80, from 89 on, those first five years after the collapse of communism, it looked so hopeful. It looked like we were going to have a, a, a much healthier uh, rapport uh, with that nation. And then it's just completely gone to hell in a handbasket. Demonizing the Russians like they're just uh, these imperial land grabbers, having, sending over our assistant secretary of state to be involved in a coup against a legitimately elected government in Ukraine in order to bring the Ukrainian nation into the, more into the American orbit. And who does that? Only people who have incredible imperial hubris. I think we are governed by people today who have completely lost, and by the way, I wouldn't just say it's a Democrat problem or a Republican problem. This is a, an American leadership problem. We have an imperial mentality. We think we're the saviors of the world. We've put our soldiers in military bases in every inch of the world, assuming that people uh, view us as a benevolent force for good, even though we ourselves know that we are in chaos. That which used to animate American life, the defense of freedom, defense of freedom, we're spying on our own citizens. We are using emergency powers 
against our own citizens and we're going to protect freedom in the world, I'm not convinced. No, I think we're in a very desperate way. And our, our provocation, I think, has led to this war in Ukraine in which a half a million young men have died, and often in the worst way. Men who share the same faith, Orthodox Christians, killing Orthodox Christians. Over what? Okay, over land. What's the purpose of land? Why do you want land if you have no young men to play in it? No people to go to school in it. No people to start businesses in it. No people to raise families. In it. They're gone, James. We have decimated that land. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. We lost 57, some say 58,000 people in Vietnam over the course of 25 years. Yeah. Measure what's happened in Ukraine on our, forgive me, on our provocation. It never would have happened without us. And we convinced the Ukrainian leadership that this is good for them. They've lost a whole generation. It's yeah. gone. It's absolutely gone. And look at Gaza. Gaza is even closer to home for Orthodox Christians in many ways because it's the Holy Land. We have a 2,000 year history and commitment to our presence in the Holy Land. And to see this, forgive me, I'm showing too, way too many of my cards about this, but to see this Zionist state irrationally in my mind allied with the United States of America, a Knesset that is full of the vast majority who think Jesus Christ was a false rabbi, properly executed for his blasphemy, and this is our chief ally? For what? For what? You know, I, my church is full of immigrants who were driven out of the Holy Land in 1948, and then later, 20 years later, by Jewish soldiers who came to their homes where they had lived for untold generations. They came at noon with guns, and they said, we're coming back at five. If you're here, we'll kill you. So they left. Many of them came to, to America. Some came to California, and they were part of the founding of my parish. They asked me when I first became their, their pastor 26 years ago, they asked me to watch the relationship between uh, Israel and Palestine with regards to vengeance. They said when there is a conflict and lives are lost, if it's been provoked by the Palestinians, watch and see how many Palestinians die for every Jewish person in, Palestine, in, in the Holy Land who dies, in Israel who dies. They suggested to me that it was one to a hundred. For every one that the Palestinians kill, the Jews will kill. 100 Palestinians. I thought, well, that's extreme. Are you kidding me? One to 100? You know, don't they believe in the just war? They signed on to international treaties. Proportionality, right? It's supposed to be one of the core uh, beliefs in the just war approach to uh, warfare. And I can't say it's one to 100, but it's at least more than one to 50. I'm watching what's happening in Gaza right now. Yes, those murderous, filthy terrorists attacked Israel, killed something like 1,500 Israelis. But what, what's the murder, what's the death rate now up to? 35,000 and still going strong? There's such a hope that these kinds of problems can be resolved by military means, that you can just sort of wipe out the bad guys and move forward and that's going to work. I mean, you just look at the, the war in Iraq. That was yes. terrible for Christians. Horrible. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You look at what's going on in Ukraine and how it, it's in danger of spreading still further. You know, it's, it's in, in some quarters, it's absolutely radioactive to even try to talk about these issues from a standpoint of everyone does evil. Every people on this earth has done evil. Every person on this earth has done evil. We ourselves have done evil and are perhaps even doing evil right now. And, you know, I'm not a Russian apologist. I, I don't want a czar. Uh, I don't want a monarch. And, you know, you, you can't simply pull these ideas out of thin air and try to impose them on large numbers of people because they're pure ideas that have formed in your head and you think that you have the correct answers. That's not the way it works. I agree uh, with you. But it's just, it's very difficult 
to try to get many Americans who have been really programmed by the nature of our political rancor. You know, to I look at Russia, just to, to finish the thought, to look at Russia and to see something other than um, what really to me in, in terms of, of religious life, Americans don't understand how close Christianity was to being utterly annihilated in the Soviet Union. And Americans are very unwilling to consider that tomorrow our life might in some way be as, as terrible or as demanding as the lives that so many of the Russian people went through. Ooh. It's like a dog that has been beaten and starved and dropped off uh, you know, in the dumpster, trying to make its way back to its master, day after day after day. And so many Americans, I'm sorry to say, are so privileged or so devoted to abstract ideas that when they see a people behaving like that dog, they make fun of it, they ridicule it, they, they bring out the statistics, oh, well, the abortion rate is still very high, yes. oh, everyone's still an alcoholic. People need to think on a deeper level and it's just so difficult to get them there without starting to cross all of these tripwires in the political discourse where it's, uh, it's, you gotta be with us or against us and if you're, if you're not out there uh, uh, attacking some enemy with incredible vitriol, then you're some kind of apologist for what they do. Uh, you look at someone like Metropolitan Hilarion, this is a very intelligent man, Western educated, a composer of, of beautiful music, being more set up to, uh, to, to ascend in the ecclesiastical ranks in Russia. And he refused to publicly endorse the war. And now he's in Hungary and there's a, probably a story as to how that all happened. It takes real moral, spiritual courage to violate the rules of the political discourse. Yes, it does. You mentioned the idea. You know, we, we Americans used to be really committed to, the, to an idea of America. For some years at a local university where I live, I taught a class called the American Experiment. We had a lot, our founding fathers had a lot of reasonable political humility. Today, it'd be, you know, be viewed as, you know, we're being protectionist and we're isolationist. You know, those are the, the verbal bombs that are thrown at people who want us to scale back our uh, investment, at least, let alone manipulation of the international scene with our military and our insistence and our meddling, at least that's how it seems to me, meddling in other countries' governance. But we used to have this idea that freedom sold itself, that self-government at the local level being the most important area, governing yourself, governing your home, governing your neighborhood. America wasn't into the large and the international and the imperial. And people were attracted to us because of our, our great love of freedom. What has happened to the American idea? Where is that? Who could reasonably look at the United States today and say that we aren't losing freedom? We don't have it just going through our fingers. This is one reason why it's so easy to demonize and why people are so rewarded for, for participating in demonization. I, you know, I, I experience some of the same difficulties here where you know, it's like Russia is not the devil. Israel is not the devil. Hamas, Ukraine, China, run, you can run down the list. None of these entities are, are the devil. And the same goes with technology. So many people have reached yes. such a point of Ooh. frustration, including, including traditionalists, including you know, faithful and devout Christians. They look at anything technological and they say, not on my watch. I'm not gonna learn how to use Bitcoin. I'm not gonna give my child a smartphone. I'm not gonna engage with any of it. I wanna live in the woods. I'm gonna hide my head in the sand and wait for it all to be over. I think that's a mistake. What do you think? Technology has always been a subject of uh, great concern to philosophers and to theologians, and obviously to God, because we find issues of uh, technology in the scriptures themselves. Mm -hmm. In the patriarchal na narratives, in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, right, the most foundational book in the entire scriptures, 
we have a description of the origin of technology from Adam's children. And the author, Moses, describes two lines, right? There's a line from Seth, a godly son of Adam and Eve, and from whom comes spiritual technology, pious people. And then the line of Cain, the man, since we're speaking of war and violence, who murdered his own brother. That is a very important account in the scriptures about what God thinks about war and death. Abel, when he was slain, his blood was so powerful that his blood transversed the heavens and even reached the throne of God and cried out to God for justice. One man. Imagine what 500,000 slain young men and the, what their blood is saying to heaven. In that line, in that line of Cain, comes a man named Tubal Cain. Tubal Cain was the inventor of forged instruments, uh, of uh, weaponry, metallurgy. Copper, he was a co considered to be a coppersmith by the fathers. That's the line, the very earthly line from which we get technological development. It's an earthly thing. And the church fathers develop, uh, they take the concept of technology into legitimate technologies that enhance human life and illegitimate technologies. Legitimate technologies like husbandry and agriculture. This is a very, very important field for the maintenance of human life. And then you have illegitimate technologies or technologies that can be terribly abused. And this is the area that really drives technology uh, in our time, which is uh, technologies of death, technologies of weaponry. You know, most of the money, mo most of our popular technologies are derived downstream from military applications Absolutely. that have been started first, where we put our real money. Everything in your phone, basically, from Everything GPS in to encryption and all the way down. Yeah. We sunk the money into it so that we could use it to defeat our enemies and to protect our nation, uh, and then it has kind of the, the common, broader application. The Greeks, the Greeks thought that technology was a, a matter very much of divine things. Uh, Plato, for instance, in his uh, dialogue called the Phaedrus, he describes this uh, interesting interaction between uh, the king of Egypt, whose name was Thamus, and a god, a Greek god named Thuth. And Thuth was the inventor of important technologies, of arithmetic, of writing. He flies in to have an audience with the king in order to sell his latest technology. And his latest technology is writing. And he says, look, I, I want you to understand this is an incredibly important technology. This is going to be uh, allowing you to retain uh, many pieces of information that you need as a king. We'll be able to write down your orders so that nobody forgets them. We'll be able to write down the names of your, your rulers in the kingdom so that you can govern them properly, etc. Well, the king was not convinced. And he said to the god, the inventor of technology, he said, you know, that's how you see it. But I think your technology is the death of memory because no one's going to listen anymore. We live in an oral culture, learning is given orally, and you have to listen very carefully and retain it in your own memory. But if you have books, if you start writing things down and you put them in books, no one's going to listen very well because they're going to tell themselves, if I need that piece of information, I can always find it in the book on the shelf. It's an incredible account that shows wisely from, from Plato's background that every technology is a give and a take. It's wonderful to have Google Maps. When I flew in to see you today, the Google Maps led my driver right here. No problem. The problem is, is that if I ever show up here at the airport and I try to find you in the future and I don't have him, I'm never going to find you. I didn't even pay attention with where he was driving. Normally, when I, was, when I was young, my father would drive us around and I would say, okay, there's two stop signs, second mm -hmm. stop sign, I make a right, and then there's this big oak tree. At the big oak tree, that's where my grandma's house is. You had the map right in here. That's where it was. Yeah. But now we have Google Maps, 
I don't have to be involved in that process. I just get in the car and assume that I'm going to show up. But I've lost my navigational skills, which is one of the chief glories of a man. You know, neuroscience tells us that women don't have the same capability for navigation that men ha have in their heads, and we're losing it because of this particular technology. So that the idea of sobriety, having a sober opinion, neither saying every technology, every new technology is good or every technology is bad, to, to step back and to think about them like Plato was suggesting that we do, evaluate every technology based upon what it's contributing and what it's taking away. And ask yourself, do I want, is that a good payoff? I'm going to lose this, but I'm going to gain that. If we applied it to the subject of using the internet for outreach, for ideas and for truth, for preaching in my case, it has the great benefit of expanding my audience. I can go from my parishioners on Sunday to a much larger digital audience, even vis visual connection with them now. That's wonderful, but there's also many negatives associated. Some people don't go to church because they just want to watch the preacher at home in the comfort of their living room on their screen. Mm -hmm. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. That's a disincarnate form of religion. And Christianity is an incarnate religion. We have holy mysteries, we have sacraments. You can't live an Orthodox Christian life unless you're with your community, receiving the holy sacraments. This is where life is given, not through a screen. Nevertheless, you are on the internet. Uh, mm. we, we're just about out of time, so uh, please let everyone know where they can find you online if they'd like to know more. You can find me on YouTube at Patristic Nectar Films. Patristic Nectar Films. We're on Rumble too, but YouTube's our main platform. Yeah, it's, uh, it's still big tech that we're leaning on for, uh, for the distribution. Maybe one day that'll change as well. Father Josiah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, James. That's all the time we've got. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, uh, maybe a comment or two. It helps us a lot. Let me know who you'd like to see me interview. Until next time, I'm James Polis. This is Zero Hour. May God have mercy on us all.